So uh, hello to everyone. We are here for another EasyChem chat. I have the pleasure today to welcome Audrey de Jong from Montpellier. Hello, Audrey. Hello. Uh, so Audrey, today we're going to talk about some issues related to intubation of critically ill patients. And my first question is, which is your strategies, which is your strategy when you pre-oxygenate these patients? Yes, this is a, a very good question uh, because uh, uh, when we are ready to intubate a patient, we have several methods of pre-oxygenation. And um, especially if the patient is in acute respiratory failure, uh, we, we use the pressure support associated with positive end expiratory pressure via a standard face mask. So we call that non-invasive ventilation, but it's just pre-oxygenation via a face mask, a very standard, where we set a very low level of pressure support and a very low level of PEEP in order to improve the oxygenation reserves. And we associate this, if possible, uh, with a semi-sitting position, which is mm -hmm. also very important to uh, increase the oxygen reserves and decrease the occurrence of desaturation. If the patient is uh, not in acute respiratory failure, not severely hypoxemic, especially if it's if it is not hypoxemic at all, at all, we can use a standard face mask to uh, to pre-oxygenate. And uh, sometimes we associate also apneic oxygenation. So we now have uh, uh, glasses of high flow nasal oxygen. Mm -hmm. So we use, we use that during the apnea in order to continue to oxygenate the patient after the induction of anesthesia. Do you still use uh, the Selic maneuver when you pre-oxygenate your patients in all of them? Uh, no, 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 it, no, it all, in all of men, uh, again, it is a risk assessment and um, or the patient has very different and we cannot compare a patient we are going to intubate uh, for, for example, an, an hemorrhage, a gastric hemorrhage, or a patient that we intubate uh, after one week for um, a, a worsening of the a COVID disease, for example. Uh, so if this last patient, maybe we will not use in practice the CELIC maneuver, but uh, a patient with a uh, risk of aspiration, with active emesis, with vomi vomiting, we will use more the CELIC maneuver. And sometimes when we release the CELIC maneuver after securizing the trachea, we saw the content of the gast gastric um, key. Who, who is in the mouth, so which is in okay. the mouth. So sometimes it could be useful. So difficult to have a clear response. It's a risk assessment. Of course, of course. Now, when you decide to pre-oxygenate the patient, the second question would be how you visualize the airways. Uh, of yeah. course, we have all uh, been uh, taught to work with the direct laryngoscopy, but now there are other possibilities, especially as per, after COVID-19, which would be your advice? Which, which, what would you use today in critical patients again? Now, in, our, in our team, and uh, the team of Professor Jaber, we, we, were, we were trained in video laryngoscopy uh, very early. Uh, for 10 years, we use video laryngoscopy in routine. So we can, we can say that we have both experience and expertise in video laryngoscopy. So now it's our standard practice. But I think the most important it, it is to use the device we know the best. Because if, if, if we don't know video laryngoscopy, or if we, we use it only in case of difficult intubation, for example, maybe it, it, won't, it, it will, wouldn't be the method of, of mm -hmm. choice. So it is a, a, team, a, a team project to use, uh, for example, video laryngoscopy instead of standard laryngoscopy. So I think it, it depends of the of the operator, and, and also do, we yeah. Just the point is that imagine that for example I'm not an expert in I've never done video laryngoscopy. Yeah. Do you think that if I do for direct laryngoscopy I need to use something with a tube? So I need to use a bougie or a stylet in all cases, or we can still do direct laryngoscopy without any support? Yes, that, that, that was my next point. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. very much. Uh, and so, so yes, uh, recently several studies were, were performed. Uh, one of our group on the use of stylet uh, in, inside the tracheal tube. 
And um, when using the stillet in the tracheal tube and direct laryngoscopy, uh, we found that the first attempt success was increased. And uh, over, over American team also compared the use of a bougie and the use of a stillet to increase the first attempt success and had similar results when using both techniques. So what we can say, if the intubation is predicted difficult or complicated, it is better when we use direct laryngoscopy to use either a bougie or a stillet in the tracheal tube. Very clear. Now you have pre-oxygenated the patient, you have decided how to visualize the airways, and then you need, of course, to choose the drugs because no, we cannot do without any uh, anesthesia or analgesia for the patient. Can you just tell us which are your drugs of choice and if there are any reasons why you choose one or another? For of course, induction of anesthesia, if you use analgesics, and if you always use a muscle paralyzer. Yes, um, in, in our team, we always use the paralysis and rapid sequence induction. So the association of a rapid onset hypnotic and a, a quick onset also neuromuscular blocker. So regarding the neuromuscular blocker, it's quite simple. We have uh, two uh, on the market, succinylcholine and rocuronium. Uh, regarding uh, the hypnotic, we use whether ketamine, and it's our first uh, intention uh, drug, and also we use sometimes etomidax. And then we have a third drug, it is propofol, uh, but in several ill patients, uh, it was proven, and, uh, and I agree with that, that uh, by the Intube study group, that it is a dangerous drug at risk of hemodynamic collapse because um, a, va a strong vasodilator effect. So I would not use a propofol for rapid sequence induction in, in routine. Just Maybe in for, selected patients, but not in routine. Just for a curiosity, do you give, for example, analgesics, opioids? Because uh, someone told me that, you know, intubation is still quite painful act. When it is, you know, a scheduled intubation, do you use uh, routinely opioids together with hypnotics and muscle paralysis? No, not, uh, not in critically ill patients. Because uh, we think that the risk of uh, using hypnotics, especially hemodynamic and the risk of severe, severe collapse, huh? which occurs in almost one half of the patients, so it's huge, huh? it is uh, higher than the, the risk of memorizing and uh, a painful procedure. And it, it's not proven that the patient memorized that pain during intubation okay. if, uh, if we did a, a, good, uh, a good protocol with hypnotics, of course. Great. So you mentioned already one of the problems that we have uh during and after the intubation, which is this hemodynamic collapse. Yes. And you cited already, you know, the intube study that we discussed already in the chat. My point is, again, as we know that this occurs very frequently, how do you manage it? Do you prefer fluids, vasopressors, both, according to, of course, to the patients, I presume? Yeah, so the, the most important is the preparation in our mind. Huh? So uh, we take time to prepare the patient before intubation. So we perform an hemodynamic assessment. And if the patient is hypovolemic, of course, we perform fluid loading before starting the intubation procedure. But uh, as we know, fluid loading is not working uh, alone. Fluid loading alone is not working very much. And we have now uh, several evidence uh, that show that fluid loading alone is not enough to prevent uh, collapse. So for each patient, we are giving norepinephrine infusion before starting the intubation procedure. So minimal doses when, when not needed immediately. And um, doing that, if the patient has an hypotension following the intubation procedure, we are ready very quickly to increase the level of vasopressors and to limit the occurrence of hypotension and of course cardiac arrest that can follow the, the hypotension. That's our okay, practice. So, so we use so both. So it's very important because everything that you said is again a matter to prepare. The operator yes. should be prepared to anticipate all the problems. I have a, a last question, very practical, which is something just after intubation. Um, of course, as you said, you use this procedure, but when we release the positive expiratory pressure and the patient is not uh, breathing anymore, there might be some collapse of the lungs. So some people you know, advocate that after intubation, 
uh, if the patient is stable, we should use a recruitment maneuver. And we know that this is very controversial in RDS. What is your yeah. opinion about that? So I, I think there is two, uh, two, two times different after intubation. Immediately after intubation, I think we should avoid uh, performing high PEEP or a recruitment maneuver uh, because the patient is not ready to support that often. Uh, but after hemodynamic stabilization, maybe uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes later, if the, if the level of saturation allows it, uh, we, we could perform a recruitment maneuver and um, pre because during the intubation procedure, the patient will be, of course, de-recruited. So it's logical. Uh, we don't enter in the debate of IRDS patient, but it's logical to perform at least one recruitment maneuver just to reopen the lung after hemodynamic stabilization. And then uh, we will see if we perform again recruitment maneuver or not. But first, we have to prevent the occurrence of cardiac arrest following intubation, which is quite frequent, and uh, avoid the recruitment maneuver immediately after. It's our opinion in uh, the team of uh, Professor Javert. Uh, I have to thank you, Audrey, because you uh, discussed uh, different, very important issues on an act that many people think is very easy. Intubate is intubate. But you underline that uh, we should be prepared to different phases of intubation and anticipate the potential problems that can derive from this act. So thanks a lot for uh, everything that you told us. And I hope to see you again in the next uh, EasyChem chat. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to underline that the, the team is important and the preparation of nurses also. Great. <laughs> with very with great cartography point. and all the protocol. <laughs> Absolutely. Very great ending point. Thanks again. Thank you.